Hello and good morning everyone joining us for uh, this webinar on using app-based and sensing methods for social science research. Uh, my name is Rika and I'll be presenting with uh, Michael and we'll introduce, myself, uh, introduce ourselves in a moment. Um, so today's talk will be focusing quite a lot on apps. Um, but we will talk about sensing a little bit, little bit near the end. And our focus is on social science research, uh, but you will see that it's applicable to a variety of, of settings, this method. So before we start, I uh, just wanted to say thank you to UK Data Service and Methods at Manchester for uh, helping us uh, host organize this, uh, this webinar, um, and also to the British Academy for funding the, uh, this project on uh, investigating using app-based and sensing methods, uh, specifically for, for looking at fear of crime. So today we will start with some introductions, um, introduce ourselves and what we do with app-based measures, um, and then we'll go into various topics around um, using these methods. So we'll talk about research design, uh, what kind of research tools are available, um, issues and uh, approaches to analyzing the data, speak a bit about ethical considerations, and look forward to uh, you know, what is next in this area. We'll also have time for Q&A at the end, um, but what we would like to ask you to do is as you come up with questions while you're listening, if you could type your questions as you think them in the box. So on your control panel, there should be a, a section that says questions. So if you just type your question in there and then click send, um, and then we'll see your questions and we'll pick uh, questions to answer at the end. So my name is Rika. I am a lecturer in quantitative methods at the University of Manchester uh, based in the Center of Criminology. And uh, I built an app called the Fear of Crime Application, uh, FOCA for short, uh, which I use to measure people's perception of safety in the environment um, as they moved about their everyday lives. And so it's a self-built Android application, which means I built it myself um, writing code in Java. And it was deployed through the Google Play Store for people to download um, and report and send the data back to me. I used uh, established survey questions to, to measure fear of crime uh, that are implemented in our national victimization survey, uh, the crime survey for England and Wales. And I adapted these questions to ask about the here and now rather than the sort of past 12 months. And, and I collected from people information about their location, uh, the time that they sent the answers, the answers they sent, so I asked them how worried they were about crime, and they could answer on a scale of one to four. Um, and I also had a pre-experiment survey, uh, which I asked participants to fill out, which I could then link to their answers to get demographic information to consider, for example, are women more worried about crime than men, and how that varies in different locations. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Chataway. I'm a lecturer and early career researcher in the School of Justice at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, my research interests are mainly in fear of crime, with a particular uh, focus on how fear of crime is measured and operationalised as a social psychological uh, process. So in terms of what uh, we're talking about today, a lot of my work to date with mobile apps has involved the use of two apps called iExperience uh, and MetricWire. So iExperience uh, was developed by the Griffith App Factory and the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Griffith University, where I did my PhD before coming to QUT. And iExperience was essentially designed to collect data from uh, smartphones on a range of topics with one of the surveys focusing on individuals' perceptions of crime. Um, and what I was really interested in doing uh, with this survey that was administered using the iExperience app was determining whether we could collect uh, meaningful data about context-dependent fear of crime, as well as other variables uh, that we know are related to fear of crime, like subjective uh, risk perceptions, so people's perceptions of the likelihood of victimisation, their perceptions of the consequences of control over victimisation and so forth. And following on from uh, this pilot study using uh, iExperience, I worked uh, with a commercial mobile developer in Canada called MetricWire uh, and used their MetricWire app to trigger momentary surveys about perceptions of crime, once again to individuals in uh, southeast Queensland, Australia. And the purpose of this study was to, uh, I guess, advance on the existing work with iExperience and develop and test a new momentary model of victimisation worry. 
that considered interactions between um, momentary worry about crime as well as um, immediate risk perceptions and perceptions of the physical and social environments. So that is me. So uh, in terms of the structure for today's presentation, we thought we'd get started by giving, I guess, a brief overview of uh, why we may be interested uh, in using app based methods and sensing methods in social science research um, and how these ideas have really grown out of early work using more traditional approach, uh, using traditional approaches like experience based sampling. So social scientists are often interested in people's everyday real world behaviour but as uh, Schiffman and his colleagues note, behaviour is seldom studied and assessed or observed as it unfolds in the real world. Um, so if we think about the discipline of psychology, a lot of the uh, work in psychology is experimental. It's done in uh, labs. It's not done in the real world. Um, so this is sort of the same in uh, criminology as well. Researchers tend to rely on global summary and retrospective self-reports of behaviour uh, in order to make generalisations about how people behave on a regular day-to-day -day basis. So for example, in the context of fear of crime research, uh, scholars often use retrospective measures of worry to develop uh, baselines of fear of crime in the community. So we ask people questions like, how often have you worried about being attacked in your neighbourhood over the last uh, month? The problem with these types of questions is that they don't really allow us to understand how fear of crime varies across time and in particular situations. So. Um, is, for example, fear of crime heightened during a particular time of day, say at night, or is it heightened when someone is in a particular place, like an unfamiliar environment and so forth? These types of questions don't really allow us to contextualise people's worries about crime. There's also, I guess, pitfalls uh, with respect to retrospective recall, when we're asking people to count back or reflect on the number of times they've experienced such episodes of fear of crime. Um, and this has potential to produce errors um, and biased estimates of fear of crime. So to overcome some of these challenges uh, with measuring, I guess, dynamic changes in behaviour over time and place, researchers have proposed uh, ecological momentary assessments, or EMAs, um, and experience sampling methods, so ESMs. So EMAs and ESMs essentially allow participants to report repeatedly on their experiences in real time in world settings over time and across different contexts or environments. So one of the, I guess, common misunderstandings around EMAs and ESMs is that they are a standalone methodology, but they actually encompass a range of different methods. Uh, so some examples of ESMs include uh, diary-based approaches and journals, so getting people to reflect about their feelings, thoughts um, and behaviours at a particular point in time. Um, and these can be done through paper pencil exercises, so getting people to sort of uh, write out journals um, or type their journals out on a computer. So some researchers have also used interaction diaries to monitor uh, social interactions between people over time and in particular places. Um, we also have smartphone assessments, which are the focus of today's presentation, so I'll talk a little bit more about them and the benefits of smartphone uh, ESM soon. And more recently, we've had a lot of work focusing on ambulatory uh, physiological monitoring. Um, which is a process where we uh, examine people's uh, physiological responses like heart rates uh, during certain activities. So the core features of EMAs and ESMs are uh, that the data are collected in real world environments, uh, hence the word ecological momentary assessment and experience sampling method. Um, the assessments focus on an individual's current state, so for example, how they're thinking and feeling in the moment, um, rather than treating these as retrospective um, experiences. Um, the moments that um, are assessed as a result of these types of techniques are strategically selected um, for assessment by a researcher. So a researcher may be interested in the number of times someone felt worried about uh, crime during the course of the day, um, or they may randomly sample people over a period of time uh, to gauge their experiences. And the final, I guess, core feature of these types of approaches is that assessments are repeated over time. So you're 
collecting multiple observations from the same individual um, in order to potentially map uh, changes in their behaviour. So as I mentioned, there are a number of different ways we can analyse social behaviour in the real world, but our focus today is really on using apps uh, and smartphones to collect context-dependent information about social phenomena. So there are a number of benefits to using smartphones to collect this type of information. The first is that they are more cost efficient in comparison to more traditional ESM approaches like your paper pencil diaries. Uh, they're adaptable to many different research designs so we can collect quantitative and qualitative information from respondents uh, using apps. Um, so for example, if we were interested in replicating those diary based approaches um, using a smartphone, we could do that through an app. Um, one of, I guess, the major benefits of using smartphones to conduct uh, EMAs is that smartphones also come with a number of different sensors, meaning that you can collect a lot of fine-grained uh, information about where a person is located. You can also use built-in time clocks in smartphones to trigger surveys uh, to respondents at particular points in time or trigger surveys based on where people are located uh, using um, device location services. We've also noticed that over the years smartphone use has been increasing in both uh, developed and developing countries. Um, so it's projected that uh, in the year 2020, uh, over 3 billion people um, will have access and own a smartphone device. And I really like this quote by Margaret Heffernan, that the cell phone has really become the adult's transitional object, uh, replacing the toddler's teddy bear for comfort and a sense of belonging. Um, and I think that's so true. We carry these devices with us regularly. We're constantly checking them. There's a lot of screen time. And as a result of that, these types of devices are potentially great uh, data collection tools because um, they're so widely used. Um, now, there are also a number of, I guess, applications of ESM and EMA studies using mobile apps and smartphones. So today we're going to focus on the work that we've uh, been doing around fear of crime, so Rika's app, uh, the FOCO app, and also my work around iExperience and uh, the Metrifier app platform. There's also been some other research exploring activity patterns and people's walking habits over time. Um, one of the most widely cited, um, I guess, apps within the ESM and EMA literature is an app called Mappiness, which was developed by McCarran and Murato. And this app was designed to uh, capture uh, people's subjective experiences of happiness within time and place. Uh, and this app was um, extremely popular. I think it was downloaded over a million times um, and generated a lot of uh, data points about happiness um, around uh, people's subjective experiences of happiness around Europe. We've also seen um, some applications of uh, smartphone-based EMAs and ESMs to uh, assessing mental health problems in real time and also um, assessing uh, various treatment interventions related to um, mental health um, related issues and behavioural medicine. Um, so Michael's gone through this sort of research design um, framework of experience sampling and um, ecological momentary assessment and how that can be um, applied to mobile phones and the benefits of, of that. Um, and I'm going to talk through some other sort of research design considerations that are important to keep in mind uh, when designing this, this kind of work. Um, and the first one I wanted to, to speak about is the importance of, of the conceptualization and operationalization of the thing that is being studied. So simply by using this, um, this mobile phone or an ESM or EMA approach, we are reconceptualizing the object of our study uh, from using survey-based approaches because we are investigating it in the, in the here and now, right? So we're already talking about something that a person is experiencing as and when they are experiencing it, right? So we're measuring that, um, which compared to surveys, we were measuring people's recollection of or um, feeling or assessment of themselves um, experiencing those, those particular elements. So there's already a bit of a change of, of definition of what, what is being 
um, uh, recorded there. But then on top of that, it's very important that we have a way of conceptualizing and operationalizing the thing that we're interested in um, that has a high uh, sort of construct validity to it. So just because all of a sudden we are now using a mobile phone and we can implement sliders or emojis or all of these other new uh, approaches to, to collecting data about this phenomenon that we're interested in, we should still keep in mind the importance of this validity, right? So are we still measuring uh, what we think we are measuring? Um, and in this uh, systematic review that we've done of um, mobile phone-based measures of fear of crime, for example, we've collected um, basically as many different ways to conceptualize and operationalize fear of crime as, there, as many papers there were. So here you can see just the list of those sort of top 10, um, but anything from uh, evaluating your sense of security or your risk or how worried you are from a scale of 1 to 5, of 0 to 10, of 1 to 4, to indicating and selecting locations that feel safe or that feel, uh, that, that evoke worry, um, all the way to using emoticons. So number six there, you can choose between scared and safe emoticons to uh, represent how you're feeling in this environment. Um, so because we're already innovating the concept to, to collect information about when and where you are, we want to be very sure that our um, conceptualization, operationalization, our, our approach to measurement is very much defensible and has this sort of high, uh, high validity score. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that's important to consider is what unit of analysis it is that we are interested in. Right? And a lot of the time, this is the person. Right, so often uh, we're interested in collecting information about a person as they go about uh, their everyday activities and they encounter the thing we're interested in. So in our case, uh, people traveling about uh, their everyday routine activities, but then all of a sudden experience fear of crime. Right, so uh, that's when we're interested in the person, but there are other options made available, uh, especially through the uh, location-based or picture-based um, capabilities of, of these smartphones. So, for example, one approach is uh, the Place Pulse um, app. So this is a web app uh, where you are presented two Google Street View screenshots and you are asked to evaluate which place looks safer. Um, and in this case, the unit of analysis is very much the location, in fact, it's the picture of the location. Um, and we're able to speak about maybe features of, of these locations that are maybe safer or, or less safe. Um, but even when we're collecting information from people, we might be interested in speaking about the places where they go, right? So we might want to say this is a scary place or this is a safe looking place or something like that. And so another approach, and this is an application that was uh, developed and, and run in the, in the Basque country in, in Spain, where people were, the people's routes were recorded. So all these lines are these uh, journeys that people took. Um, and at the end of the day, a randomly selected route was um, uh, presented to the person using the phone and they were asked to evaluate how safe they felt on that particular route. So in this case, the unit of analysis was these uh, routes that, that people took and, and evaluated. So there's options there as well, um, and it's important to consider what are we interested in, what is the unit of analysis um, for our study. Um, another point that's important to think about here is the uh, sample. So it's possible to get very large sample sizes. And Michael mentioned Mappiness, which got, I think, over 66,000 participants and was incredibly popular and uh, resulted in loads and loads of fantastic data. Uh, but often that's not the case. So again, um, we have a, uh, we've been looking at papers using apps to look at fear of crime. And eight out of 27 papers we looked at, they said that they encountered small sample size as a limitation um, of their, uh, their study. Um, and they highlighted some reasons as to why this might be. One of the reasons was a, a lack of incentives for people to participate. And to remedy that, they found some possible motivations um, that, that people say they had for participating in an app. So for example, some people said that if an app had helped them in the past, they were more likely to use it again in the future, so if it did something for them or if they had some specific concerns about neighborhood safety themselves and it was relevant to their neighborhood, then they would be more likely to, to use these apps. Um, some people also quoted registration as a barrier to participation. So if you remove the need to register for the study, if you can participate anonymously, um, then that is another step that might 
increase that, that sample. However, um, you might want to think about sort of sampling biases that um, these sorts of uh, approaches might introduce. Um, another thing to consider when designing your study is how long should it be, right? So what should be the duration of the study? And here, as in I think with pretty much all research, the answer is really it depends. So there is no sort of hard and fast rule as to a study, a VSM looking at X topic has to go on for N number of days. It really depends on what it is that you're interested in. So for example, in this particular study, uh, when they were looking at um, experiences over a, a specific event, so it was a festival, you can see it started at 8.30 p.m. and finished at 3.30 in the morning. So the duration of the study was what, seven hours, um, and that is all exactly how long it needed to be to cover the duration of that study, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, my specific study that I did in London, um, I ran over four months, um, and you can see that uh, it, I had sort of varying, varying levels of, of participation there. And an interesting thing to note here um, is that you can see at the end the participation kind of trails off. And this is a very important thing to keep in mind with the, with the timing, when you're designing the timing of the study as well. And a particular paper that we found has actually picked this up as a limitation. And this is the phenomenon that when you launch your study, you will uh, inevitably get quite a lot of participation and as the study goes on, you will get fewer and fewer people continuing to participate, and those who participate will potentially um, produce fewer reports. So this has implications uh, for when you launch your study. For example, if the thing that you're interested in has seasonal patterns, then it, you might get very different results if you launch in summer or winter, for example. So that's another thing uh, to keep in mind. So these are some things to, to think about in your research design. Um, but now we're going to move on and, and talk about what kind of research tools uh, you might want to use. So the big question here um, is really whether you want to use a tool that is self-built. So do you want to build something yourself um, or you get someone to, to build something for you? Or do you want something that's off the shelf that already exists? Um, and again, it really depends on what sorts of data you want to collect and how the off-the-shelf products meet these requirements that you might have. Uh, so for example, when I started my study, I had a look at this application called EpiCollect. Um, so this is developed by some guys, uh, I think, at LSE or Imperial. Um, but anyway, what it allows you to do is to build your own survey, and it will deploy the survey into their application. And so your participants just need to download EpiCollect, um, load it up into their phone, type in your survey ID, and they are immediately faced with your questions that you want to ask. And it can collect extra info, like GPS, photographs, um, and so on. So this is great, but for my purposes, it didn't quite do what I needed because with fear of crime and possibly with other sensitive subjects you might be asking about, um, I wanted people to have a chance to remove themselves from a scary situation before having to take out an you know, expensive mobile phone um, and report to me that they are now worried about crime. And EpiCollect did not um, allow me to have this sort of retrospective annotation option. And so I have here a bit of a, a flow chart of, of all the, I have to draw this out, of all the ways that I wanted to collect data. So I wanted to have a reminder, but also I wanted to, when people experience something, have the option to report now, but also to have this retrospective annotation. That's called option three over there. Um, and because uh, EpiCollect didn't allow that. I had to build my own application. Of course, this involved learning how to program in Java, which meant that I could only deploy on Android. Um, so it was a bit of a journey, but I, I, I'd end up with me having something that did exactly what I needed it to do. Okay, so I just wanted to also quickly touch on um, some of my experiences of using off-the-shelf uh, apps. So as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of today's presentation, I worked with a commercial vendor um, called Metricwire Inc. Uh, that has developed an application and platform to conduct uh, EMAs using uh, smartphones. So Metricwire is based out of Canada, uh, but they work as researchers all over the world. Um, and the platform that they've developed allows researchers to integrate uh, momentary surveys into a Metricwire mobile app. So very similar to the EpiCollect design. Um, 
the great thing about MetricWire is that it provides researchers with, I guess, more control over how surveys are triggered to respondents. So you can trigger surveys at particular times of day, random intervals um, of time, um, or when a respondent enters or exits a particular the geofence location. So there's a variety of sensors that are already available um, in the MetricWire platform. Um, the other thing that uh, is great about MetricWire is that you can set up studies initially as pilots and then uh, transfer all of this information in regards to survey formatting, including um, the setup of your triggers, to a full-scale study uh, with relative ease. So it's just sort of a copy and paste over um, of your survey into um, a full-scale study design. Um, and the solution that they've developed or the platform that they've developed is compliant and secure. Um, and that's a really important thing to think about when um, conducting EMAs with smartphones is the ethics of around privacy uh, and data storage. Um, and so MetricWire's solution meets all of the privacy standards in Canada, but also privacy standards um, in Australia. Okay, um, so just to summarise some of, I guess, the pros and cons of the different app tools um, that are available. So when you build your own app, uh, the main benefit is that you have complete control over how the app is designed, what it looks like to the end user, what triggers and sensors you're building into the app, uh, and so forth. You also have uh, control over when you update the app and when you want to add new features um, over time to the app. The cons of building your own app are really associated um, with costs around maintenance and bug fixes. So for example, when I was working on the iExperience project when I was at Griffith, there were some very big uh, changes to iOS from iOS 9 to iOS 10, which resulted in iExperience actually crashing every time it was open. Um, and the cost to actually fix uh, that issue was actually quite expensive because we had to purchase plugins to um, develop the code to fix those issues. And so that wasn't really sustainable for my research budget. Um, and there was obviously also costs um, associated with time actually taken to write the new code and fix those issues. Um, and finally, something to consider is that you do need technical expertise uh, to build an app from scratch. So that's something to really think about in the initial planning of a smartphone-based uh, EMA study. So you might want to develop uh, a transdisciplinary team of researchers, which is what we did with iExperience. So we had a team of IT experts who were responsible for building, I guess, the back end of the app, making sure that all the logic was there, um, and so forth, and then a team of um, academics who consulted on the development of the survey instrument, fed the data uh, back to the IT team. So that's a way to sort of deal with um, that issue around a need to have technical expertise, is to work in transdisciplinary teams where you um, can sort of uh, divide certain um, aspects of your project between those teams. All right, so um, the pros uh, to off-the-shelf apps are that um, most of the platforms that have been developed have very easy interfaces that you can easily navigate through. So for example, um, with uh, MetricWire, I sort of liken that platform to uh, a Qualtrics-like interface. So it's quite easy to follow and set up your study and set up your triggers. Uh, and you can see how your questions are going to look on the mobile device uh, and so forth. Uh, the other pro is because you're not really writing code for the app, you're not building it yourself, uh, this is done by the developer, you don't actually require detailed tech knowledge, but you do have to have some level, I guess, of understanding around how triggers work uh, with a smartphone and how to sort of troubleshoot issues that may arise uh, during a particular study. And I guess the main, um, I guess, uh, issue with off-the-shelf apps um, is that they do have limited flexibility. So in other words, you have to really rely on what is already available to you by the developer in terms of built-in sensors, triggers, and um, certain types of questions that you can ask participants using their app. 
Okay, um, so we've spoken about how to, you know, design your research using uh, mobile apps and what sort of tools uh, are available and when you might want to make the decision to, to develop your own tools and what are some of the pros and cons associated with, with each approach. And um, so let's say now you've conducted your study, you've collected your data, what are some things uh, to keep in mind when you're carrying out your data analysis uh, of uh, your, what, what you have collected. Um, and so I'm, we, we're being very negative and, and focusing on the issues uh, here, but we, we promise we will come up with, the, with some possible solutions as, as well. Uh, so one of the key themes uh, that emerged, as I mentioned, we're looking at uh, these studies that use apps to measure fear of crime. And one of the key themes to emerge were issues around sampling and, and the generalizability of, of, our, of our data that were collected. Um, and so we have this sentence here, many of the limitations identified can be subsumed into the overarching category of issues around sampling. While a common and widely researched problem with sample surveys, this issue is revisited each time a new platform for collecting data is introduced. Um, and so obviously using uh, mobile phones for to implement EMAs or ESMs, uh, this is uh, an issue that has reared its head again. So we looked at the types of sampling issues that were mentioned, and we uh, categorized them into essentially four themes. The first one being participation inequality, um, which I'll speak about in a bit more detail in a moment, uh, because that was identified by far by the most number of, of papers that we looked at. Um, but it roughly just refers to the unequal contribution uh, between the different participants in your study. Um, there was an issue of no screening questions um, where many apps, they don't require a pre-selection questionnaire. Um, they might not collect demographic information. And especially when we were speaking about how to increase your sample sizes, and one of the approaches was uh, to remove registration for your app, as it might be a barrier. But if you remove that, you might lose uh, collecting these data that allow you to speak to the representativeness um, of your sample afterwards once you've collected your data. Um, and then the two issues, the participation decrease and the small sample size, uh, we've already spoken about um, in this sort of research design uh, section. So participation inequality is something that is relevant to basically any sort of crowdsourced uh, study. So uh, these are some nice sort of inequality triangles, and I'm sure you've heard of the sort of 1% rule of, of the internet. Um, but I quite like this, uh, the red triangle on the right-hand side of, of your screen, which refers to Wikipedia. So I'm sure we all use Wikipedia. Some of us might even contribute to it. Um, but it's very interesting to see the numbers where essentially 99.8% of people, they only read Wikipedia, right? They don't really contribute. 0.2% um, of people are occasional contributors. So they do um, one or two um, the, the one or two articles are a bit of contribution, something like that. But it's 0.0003% of people um, who contribute the majority of the content. So they are the sort of heavy, heavy contributors um, on Wikipedia. So this is something to keep in mind if you, especially if you take a sort of crowdsourcing approach to your, to your participant recruitment. Um, and it's something that uh, is important to look at in your in your data. So here uh, I looked at participation inequality in people who are participating in the FOCA study um, and I drew up this uh, Lorenz curve which is something economists use to look at things like um, unequal distribution in wealth or income, this sort of thing. Um, and so if you had perfect uh, equality you would see the straight line that kind of goes through the middle there. Um, but unfortunately I do not. You can see I have this very much curved line um, and you can see that quite a lot of people, so maybe up to 60% of people, they are very much occasional contributors to the app. Um, and then you can see there's a sort of top 20% and even the, the top, um, looks like the top 10 or 5%, they are sort of the very heavy contributors. Um, so you get this uh, weighting of responses uh, nested within these sort of heavy, heavy contributors. So this is something to keep in mind and acknowledge and um, even if you don't require sort of participant registration to somehow try and consider how you might uh, account for this unequal participation that tends to happen in such crowdsourcing projects.
Okay, so uh, depending on the way you've actually designed your study and, um, as Rika said, the unit of analysis you've chosen, there are really a number of analytical methods uh, available to deal with data that's been collected um, from a smartphone-based EMA. So first, it is worth noting uh, that most traditional uh, statistical approaches, like your linear regressions and things like that, um, are not always appropriate for EMAs and ESMs. Um, and this is really due to assumptions of independence among observations in these traditional tests. Um, so when deciding on analytic methods um, and ways to analyze your data, you need to sort of consider um, the time and place dependencies in your data as well as the unit of analysis. So whether you're looking at situations or individuals and so on. So um, there are some possible analytic approaches that you can undertake with EMA data. Um, at a descriptive level, you could aggregate EMA data to uh, certain time intervals for each respondent and produce temporal heat maps showing certain patterns and trends in your data. So for example, you may uh, want to map when reports of worry are most frequently uh, reported across a period of 24 hours. So you can do that with a heat map um, showing hot and cold areas where worry is heightened um, in relation to crime. You can also use trend plots to show spikes and declines in certain behaviours. So uh, Rika showed a diagram from um, her dissertation, uh, which is a trend plot. So you can do something of um, a similar nature. Um, if you're like me and you're interested in whether the data fits a particular hypothesised model, um, you may wish to consider using uh, multi-level modelling. Um, and this allows you to sort of take into account varying situations and times when the surveys have been completed uh, by users on the mobile app. So MLMs really do allow you um, to recognise the hierarchical structures within your data and analyse different levels of that hierarchy. Um, there's also regression tree modelling. Um, this is somewhat similar to MLM. Some people tend to um, suggest that you'll get similar results with both approaches, but you should really do both of them separately because you do get um, slight differences uh, depending on uh, whatever approach you use. But regression tree modelling is really an exploratory approach where you break down a data set into smaller and smaller subsets or branches. And what that allows you to do is uncover, I guess, meaningful associations between variables uh, within your data and different categories of those variables. So the problem, though, with uh, these approaches of multi-level modelling and regression tree uh, modelling is that you do require a significant sample size um, to achieve power. So you do need to assess some of those issues as well that Rika talked about previously in relation to participation and equality because those issues will definitely impact um, the structure of those models. Um, if you have uneven distribution of participation and engagement with EMAs. Um, so there are also some other, I guess, approaches that you may consider when your data are not of sufficient quality to do these um, suggested types of tests like multi-level models and regression tree models. Um, so at the moment, something that I'm looking at uh, and researching into is the use of Bayesian multi-level models. So Bayesian methods are um, less, I guess, sensitive to sample size issues. Um, so they are potentially a possible alternative um, to these more common, I guess, EMA data approaches like multi-level modelling when you're dealing with rather small sample sizes. Uh, there's also the case study oriented approach where you can sort of focus on just one individual and their data and um, their case study oriented approach or N of one designs are quite useful uh, when you're looking at the impacts of uh, a particular treatment um, on an individual over time and you're mapping that and recording that type of information using uh, smartphone apps. It is also worth noting that depending on the way your data, uh, your, sorry, your study is designed, um, that there may actually be opportunities to analyse qualitative data that's collected um, from a smartphone app. Um, so, for example, in my recent work with Metroquire, what I did was I collected textual data from participants uh, and then conducted a thematic analysis of this textual data to identify certain themes relating to safety perceptions in the proximate environment. So, 
you still have to actually make sure that you're accounting for the repeated assessments in your data when you're using a qualitative approach um, to the analysis of EMA data that's collected from a smartphone device. Um, because obviously the themes that you identify in your data, they need to sort of represent groups, not just individuals. So that's why it's really important um, in the initial setup of these app studies that you label your participants with unique identifiers so you can make sure that you're not just analysing the opinions of one individual and forgetting the rest of the group um, of other individuals that complete your surveys. Um, so you may also be able to analyse geotagged images uh, in studies where participants may take images of their immediate environments and link these images uh, to maps or hotspot maps using mapping software. Um, you could also take a more aggregated approach to analysing images that are collected from smartphones. Um, so, for example, you could potentially conduct, a, I guess, a street-level audit of disorder cues um, based on images that are taken by participants' smartphones and sort of extract certain features of those images through a content analysis. So I mentioned that uh, we're going to touch upon ethics, but honestly, uh, ethics uh, using this kind of research, it could be a whole other webinar in itself. Um, so what we decided to do is really just highlight a couple of, of key points that are unique um, to, to this uh, method and something that you might encounter uh, as you are going about getting ethical approval for your study or just you know, being a good ethical researcher. Uh, but this list is by no means exhaustive. It's just some of, the, some of our highlights that we've gotten from ethics committees and reviewers, really. Um, and the, the first one is a sort of mirror measurement effect or the Hawthorne effect. Or, you know, it's got its many names. Of, uh, it essentially just refers to you are affecting the thing you are measuring by measuring it, right? so by your, your approach to measurement. And you might say, oh, this really sounds like a methodological issue rather than an ethical issue. Um, but in the case of asking people repeatedly about something that is sensitive, uh, so in our case, asking people repeatedly about their worries of, uh, about crime, it might be that by asking about it repeatedly, we might increase this in, in the participants. So that's something to think about. So if you keep asking someone, are you worried, are you worried, are you worried yet? Um, and the outcome of that is that now they're very worried about crime, then that becomes a sort of ethical issue. Um, another one that Michael touched upon pr uh, previously with the when you're selecting is the right tool for you is that of privacy and personal identification. So if you're working within Europe, you uh, must comply with GDPR regulations. Um, so if you're collecting personal data, you must make sure that it's uh, compliant with, with these rules. Um, but it's very important to think about what could count as personal data. So if you're collecting repeated locational information about a person and uh, between 9 to 5 Monday to Friday, Day, they're always reporting from one location and between you know 9 p.m. and 8 a.m. and also on the weekends in another location you can start to recognize that this is where they live and where they work right even though you've not explicitly asked them these details you are collecting these kinds of data um, and so that's something to, to keep in mind and that links with the point also about data storage ethics um, and that's something to especially look into because if you're designing your own tool it's something that you consider in the design process. But if you're using an off-the-shelf app, you want to think about how their data storage um, complies with the, your, your requirement. Um, and another one that's kind of uh, our, our pet peeve that we both sort of encountered and, and been approached by people are you creating this kind of safety mapping at the service. And if you're working on collecting data, again, about something that's a bit subjective, right, that's something that people are subjectively reporting their experience in an environment, then using that to then deliver a service has its own ethical implications. So firstly, just by saying this place is scary and this place is not, you might be stigmatizing uh, these areas, you might be labeling uh, people who belong in those areas, but also just by saying this place is dangerous, delivering that as a service, you might reduce footfall in the area, which then reduces you know, guardianship and formal surveillance, and then might actually create more more scary uh, areas in, in that sense. Um, also, the data that we're collecting, besides all of the sampling biases that we've already spoken about, they are people's subjective evaluations. So two people might evaluate something differently. And the people who tend to participate in these projects, um, they might be of certain demographics, um, and so that can cause all sorts of uh, issues as well. 
Okay, uh, so we wanted to sort of end the presentation just by quickly going over some of the ways we can move forward in using mobile apps and sensing methods in social science uh, research. So the first thing uh, I want to talk about is uh, that we are seeing rapid technological developments in respect to various sensors in smartphones and also wearable devices like your Apple Watches. So what this means is that we can develop apps that collect even more, I guess, dynamic information about a participant as they go about their everyday activities. So for example, it is possible to build in sensors to an app uh, that sense uh, acceleration in the device. So that allows you to determine when something is moving or when there's been a sudden shift in movement. Um, you can have sensors that assess ambient light and room temperatures. Um, you can even build sensors that report information on magnetic fields that are around um, a particular device. So there's a number of, I guess, applications of uh, these different uh, types of sensing methods that are now available um, as a result of the rapid uh, development in uh, smartphone technologies and also the inbuilt sensors that are available in these new devices that Apple and Samsung and all these other providers are bringing now. All right, so finally, from my perspective, I also think that it's important that we start to look at how we can develop uh, multi-layered questions uh, with mobile app EMAs to provide specific information um, about the context in which um, certain social behaviours are expressed. So what I mean by this is that a lot of smartphone EMAs tend to only use very short survey questions, and this is really just a function of the EMA design itself, that it's meant to be momentary um, and in the moment, but I think that um, there's opportunities to sort of better understand the context in which these surveys are being completed by asking um, follow-up questions that may collect more qualitative information from a respondent. So, for example, um, here I just have some images of the Metric Wire app for a project that's currently in the development phase uh, by myself and a colleague at the Uni of Tampa. Um, so we start off with a multiple choice question. We ask people about um, how worried they are about being attacked by a stranger in the media environment. We then follow that up with a text-based response asking them to provide us some more details around why they have provided a certain response to that initial question. And then we ask them to sort of take a photo of the environment around them to provide, I guess, context and meaning uh, to that immediate location, and then to drop a pin on the map and tell us where they're currently located. So I think these multi-layered questions are a nice way of sort of better contextualising the environments that people are in. And I think we shouldn't just be relying on just the collection of quantitative data from multiple choice questions in apps, but we should also be layering it um, with some additional questions which allow us to tell a bit more of a story um, behind people's experiences. Um, and then for myself, there's sort of two directions that I am trying to sort of build, build upon this. The first one is to see if we can link these uh, mobile phone-based uh, questionnaires with external sensors, so sensors that are that do not come with a mobile phone, no matter how fantastically advanced they are, they are becoming. And um, so I'm working with uh, sensors that carry physiological measurement, for example, things like a galvanic skin response or heart rate monitor, so we can sort of corroborate what people are saying when they are evaluating their feelings, so whether they report worry or not, versus what their sort of physiological response uh, is saying. Um, almost like a lie detector, if you will, uh, or with things like uh, eye trackers to provide that contextual information um, that, that Michael mentioned as well, um, so that we can see what the person sees and specifically where they focus when they are creating these, these reports and sending these data points back. So that's sort of one direction, connecting with the sensing, and it did say there will be sensing in this talk. I'm sorry it's so short. Um, and then the other direction that we're looking at is just really trying to improve the generalizability of these data. So we have all of these sort of parallel pilot studies now working, collecting these data, and then saying, oh, we've got these caveats of 
who they're representative of, where they're representative, how they're representative, and how they're not. Um, but actually, we should really start thinking about developing strategies to, to address these biases and to improve uh, the generalizability and reliability of, of these data. Um, so one approach that we looked at is um, to use a small area estimation. Um, so we've got uh, this paper forthcoming, um, but if you send me an email, I can, I can send it to you. Uh, but there must be loads of other strategies out there. So I think if anyone's looking for directions for research in this area, then looking at sort of uh, helping us improve generalizability of these data would be a really exciting um, decision and contribution to this field. So that is it from us. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for, for, for questions and answers. And you see we've had a, a whole bunch of questions uh, coming in. So I think we can just go through them in chronological order. Michael, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the first question uh, we have is, are these apps uh, free to download in Google Play? Um, so for the end user, most of the apps are free to download. Um, but in terms of um, the researcher perspective, um, if you're using a um, off-the-shelf app, there's obviously costs associated with purchasing um, the software needed to um, develop uh, the survey instrument and deliver it using an off-the-shelf app. So um, long story short, I guess, is that they are usually free. Um, to the end user, but if your question's in reference to the researcher and um, off-the-shelf apps, you tend to have to um, pay for certain features and obviously um, payment varies on the number of sensors that you might incorporate into an app and so forth. Mm. Well, it depends as well because I know that EpiCollect is free, mm. but it might, I don't know if it has limitations as to what you can and can't do with the free one and if there's a paid one. Cause, but the one that I tried out was definitely free to use for research. Um, and then, but yeah, I'm assuming things like the, the flashier ones will be paid for you and then free for the participant to download and uh, volunteer their data. Uh, but also there's another point to make here is that the app, there might be people who release their app open source. So for example, I did that. So I built the Fear of Crime app uh, in Java and I put it all on GitHub. Um, and so I'm assuming that other researchers who also are happy to share their code in this way will have done the same. So it might be worth, if you're reading a paper and somebody's used an app that's exactly like the one that you want to use, just sending them a note, because it might be that they, so I released my app on GitHub immediately after, um, or with, with my PhD, but no one's really used it. So <laughs> it might be a case of just people don't know that it's this open. Um, okay, so the second one's got my name in it, so I'll answer. You were talking about systematic review. Has that been published yet? Uh, no, so that's been under review since January. Um, fingers crossed it'll come back with some good constructive comments and it'll be out hopefully this year. But again, if you send me an email, uh, my email is just on the screen now, or a message on Twitter, I'll send you the, the submitted version. Um, and then I can share that. Cool. Um, so there's quite a few questions around how do you encourage, uh, I guess, people to participate in these studies. So I think uh, we'll probably just answer that um, as a whole. Um, so this is, I don't know about Rika, but for me this has always been a really big challenge um, in terms of getting people to participate in these types of studies. Um, we can see that it's possible, you know, mappiness is a great example of that, um, being able to generate a lot of interest. Um, I think there's a few things to sort of consider. Uh, some studies will uh, use incentives, as Rika uh, mentioned, to, um, I guess, pull people in um, and um, attract people to particular studies. Um, but I guess the problems with using incentives is one, um, you have to know when that goes into sort of being coercive um, and becoming an ethical issue. And so I think um, part of um, my work now in terms of leading on from all of these pilot studies that I've been doing with mobile apps is to really look at how we can tie these data collection components of the apps to 
actual benefits for the user. So if we look at like the top five apps that are downloaded on the App Store, we can see that they are downloaded for a specific purpose, for a specific benefit to a user. So I'm looking for ways to sort of increase participation and uh, in these types of app studies by um, developing, I guess, some benefits around using the app other than just collecting data from participants, um, which I think is potentially a reason for why people are just not wanting to, um, I guess, immediately enrol in these types of studies. Um, that's just my thoughts, I guess, Rico. Um, I'll hand it over to you if you have any. I, I completely agree with that. So they, people either want something in return, and I think if you, so for example, uh, if you want to upload something into the Apple Play Store and you ask for a location, I think you have to provide some sort of value back to the person that has used that location. So definitely this uh, providing something back to people. Um, and also, yeah, as I found as well, if you target specific interest groups, so if some groups are really interested in um, a particular topic, um, then you can rally those people, but then you have this sort of self-selection bias um, of, uh, of people who are already motivated to, to discuss something. Um, but targeting small, specific groups tends to be one way to increase participation. But yeah, I think this is the uh, million-dollar question, right? How do I get more participants um, if, I, if I knew? So the other question there is uh, about age and how do you restrict age? So you can always have a have this approach that commercial apps have of, are you over 18? Please be over 18 to use this website. And then you kind of put the onus on the, on the person signing up. Um, and I think there's ways, I, do, I actually, so Michael, step in if you know, there must be some ways to try and enforce this. Um, because I know there's a recent social networking app called TikTok that's gotten into trouble because it had all these sort of 13-year-olds signing up to live blog themselves. Um, when they really shouldn't have been. And so the TikTok company, they got fined because they didn't take all reasonable precautions to make sure that their users weren't underage. So there must be some sort of guidelines for making all reasonable precautions, but unfortunately I don't know where you would find them. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's really a challenge. And also like having screening surveys as well, um, screening out people um, who don't meet the age requirements is potentially a way to reduce that issue as well. Um, we've had some questions around different types of um, analyses that could be undertaken with the data and I certainly agree we could definitely use uh, uh, long longitudinal methods like uh, generalized methods of moments um, and other time series analyses. Um, we also have a question around uh, using survival anal analysis um, to analyze um, people who sort of opt in to um, the study for longer periods of time, so sort of dealing with um, those issues that uh, Rico was addressing earlier on in the presentation. I 100% agree. There's a really good uh, paper that sort of describes some of the general uh, techniques in EMAs um, using smartphones by Schwartz and Stone. I forget the year, but if you just Google Schwartz and Stone, uh, EMAs, you should be able to find um, that really comprehensive article that goes through all of the different types of analyses. There's also been some more recent uh, work published in health psychology around the different analyses. But yeah, I certainly agree there's many different methods that you can use and those definitely seem suitable for this type of um, approach. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um... So would you say any specific ethical consideration when using these methods with children, young people? Um, I would say, so if, if you're using this with any sort of vulnerable group and children, young people fall into a vulnerable group, from my perspective, you would take the same precautions you would take with any other methodology when you're applying it to children or, or, or vulnerable group. Um, on top of that, I don't know if there's anything introduced by the technology, and Michael, you can speak to this if you if you think so, but I think um, children will be just as uh, technology literate and maybe even a little bit more privacy literate in terms of where and where they won't report from. Um, but yeah, I would say the same amount of extra precautions as you would if you used if you use the same sample in in experiments or a focus group or something like that. 